Hello, welcome to another episode of History Hack. We are very, very excited today. Alex, tell us who we got. Yes, we are excited indeed. Ian Dale is a man of many, many talents. Uh, He's an award-winning broadcaster, political commentator and publisher, and he's also written dozens, dozens of uh, books and has a new one out just in time for Christmas called The Prime Minister's 1721 to 2020, 300 Years of Political Leadership. Oh, this just proves to be utterly fascinating. I've I've cherry-picked and gone in and jumped about and read some of it already. Ian, welcome. Hello. Oh, I guess just first of all, what made you want to edit this book and how did you go about compiling it? Because to put it all in one volume, I just looked at it because um, I was like browsing on Amazon like you do. And I just I thought this I need this book. I need an overview of leadership in Britain. And I want this book. Well, I was astonished that no one had done it before, to be honest. Um, but it's the, it's the 300th anniversary of the Office of Prime Minister uh, next April. Well, sort of, because Sir Robert Walpole, who was our first Prime Minister, he came to power in 1721. But he wasn't called Prime Minister initially. It only happened towards the end of his premiership, towards the end of the 1730s. And he took it as an insult. Because we have this phrase, primus inter pares, which first among equals, and he regarded himself as just the first Lord of the Treasury, which was the official title. Um, So he took great exception to this. And it wasn't really until 1905 under Sir Henry Campbell Bannerman that the phrase prime minister was used in legislation or formally within government. Um, So the, the office has had quite an interesting history. So I thought, well, look, I'm an ultimate political geek. I love all things political. Mm. But even even I had never heard of one or two of the early prime ministers. Have you heard the, of the Earl of Shelburne, for example? I, I certainly no, haven't. No, not at all. I was looking down the list and I thought I'd recognise them all and I, I clearly didn't. No, quite. So what I decided to do is I thought, well, I can't write about them all. Um, I don't know enough about them. Uh, so I thought, well, I know plenty of people who do. So I started to, uh, this was even before I'd approached a publisher, I started to ask people from the world of politics, um, politicians, journalists, academics, historians, if they'd like to take part. I said, look, there's going to be no money in it because books like this generally don't sell tens of thousands of copies, but it's a book that ought to be available. And um, everyone said, I think with one exception, everyone said yes. So um, here we are. Um, It's been published now for about two weeks. Oh, it's brilliant. Um, I really do hope it goes well for you. Uh, like you say, the role of pri- uh, prime minister, it's not no one sat out and decided there should be a prime minister. It kind of evolved. Um, well, it, it depends how far you want to go back. I mean, it, in, in those days, the, the relationship between the First Lord of the Treasury and the uh, monarch was absolutely crucial, obviously far more than it is today. Today, you've got the relationship between the the prime minister and the general public. Um, In those days, uh, there were elections, but a lot of the MPs were elected in so-called rotten boroughs. And um, so it it was really the the, the monarch. You You had to please the monarch because the monarch had the power to get rid of you. It wasn't necessarily the electorate that got rid of you. It was the monarch. So, um, and that that really only changed in the latter part of Queen Victoria's reign, because if you've watched that ITV series, which I'm sure you will have, um, (laughs) the relationship between the young Victoria and her prime ministers was absolutely crucial. Um, But as we move towards the 20th century, the power of the monarchy, the influence of the monarchy diminished. So we're going to talk about a few of the ones that stood out for you during the editorial process. So tell us who was the oldest the oldest prime minister, um, that is a very good question. I think, was it Churchill? I mean, I, I've, I think it was either Churchill or Gladstone. Um, they would certainly have been um, among the oldest. Um, Churchill, I think, was over 80 when he left power in 1955. Um, Gladstone is the only prime minister to have served four separate terms in office between 1868 and 1894. Um, and, and he was in his 80s when he left as well, I think. Uh, he was. So I think Gladstone was the oldest to be appointed overall, apparently, at 82 mm. um, on, on the fourth time. But the John uh, Viscount Palmerston, John Temple, was the uh, oldest to assume office for the first time at 70. 
Well, yeah, that is right. I mean, the one thing you have to bear in mind on this is that I edited the book. I haven't written it. So yeah. you're not, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not going to be an expert on every single prime minister, but uh, fire them at me. <laughs> yeah. Which was, which of the older ones impressed you and given how much stress is involved in the job? Well, I think Gladstone is the one that, although I knew a bit about Gladstone, I think Simon Heffer's essay on him in the book is is absolutely the best one of all. Uh, And I learned so much from it, not just about him as a politician, but as a person as well. It's made me want to go and read a proper biography of him. There's a wonderful uh, book, which I've had for years by Roy Jenkins, that he wrote about 20, 25 years ago. Right. I think that that's probably the, the best one to start with. There are multi-volume biographies of Gladstone as well. Um, and he, he was somebody who started off as a Tory. And he went to the Liberals over the Corn Laws uh, crisis in the late 1840s, which, of course, heralded the modern-day Conservative Party and the modern-day Liberal Party, because before then they were called the Tories and the Whigs. And um, it was really only then that there, there was party organisations that, that sprung up in, in the way that we would recognise them now. Before those days, um, even though you would describe, I suppose you would describe the Whigs and Tories as political groupings, they were fairly broad factions more than anything else. What about the youngest? The youngest was William Pitt the Younger. Um, who was a very long-serving prime minister, I think, is it 1783 to 1801? And then he had another short period after that. Um, and, and if you're compiling a top 10 list of prime, prime ministers out of the 55, he would certainly be in it. Um, and obviously his father was prime minister, um, William Pitt the Elder, or the Earl of Chatham, as he then became. But he, he wasn't considered to be, he wasn't there for very long, and he wasn't that successful. But uh, William Pitt certainly left his mark on uh, on history. And of course, William Hague wrote a superb biography of him. 24, and he's prime minister. Yeah. <laughs> You see, today we live in an age where people are obsessed by youth. And if if you don't get into Parliament by by the time you're 35 or 40, you might as well forget it. Whereas in most other countries, that's when you're starting to think of a political career and you have a maybe a successful career behind you before you go into politics. That's not the case in this country anymore. Um, I, I gave up any aspirations of being an MP when I was 48, which... If you're in America or France or Germany, that's that's when you start thinking about it. I want to throw something in because this is something Alex doesn't actually know about me. Actually, most people don't know this about me. So I ran for local council elections when I was 19 years old. I was, oh, that's so cool. So I was planning a a, um, a career in politics, but then I kind of decided that it was too stressful, and I decided to kind of not go down that road. Was that in East London? You did that? I did. I did in Hackney, actually. Well, good on you. I, I did it in Norwich when I was at university. And um, I always remember on polling day, I was taking three old ladies to vote in my Ford Cortina Mark III. This was about, oh, I don't know, 1983, I suppose. And um, I went to turn right into the polling station. And as I turned right, a motorcyclist tried to overtake me and hit the front of the car, went right over the bonnet and broke his leg. So I was directing traffic, waiting for the ambulance in my blue rosette. And the old ladies went in to vote and I never did discover how they got home. <laughs> later, later, later that night um i i found out where, where this guy lived so i went round to, uh, to see his parents and there, there was a vote labor sticker in the window and i was of course the tory candidate so um uh, i'm not sure they were very impressed by that but uh, it was completely his fault and that's my so when you were reading people's contributions for this book who do you think who stood out for you as being the most effective prime minister who got stuff done that's a really good question because I, everybody will have their different definition over what effective means. Mm. It may be different in the 1780s to the to the 1920s or 2020s. Um, it, it really goes back to what what makes a great prime minister. And, and I think what I've found throughout this whole process is that you, you have different types of prime ministers. Some who are really good on the detail. Some who are very broad brush. Prime Ministers, like Boris Johnson, you would describe as maybe somebody who's a little bit light on the detail. But you see, at a time like this, you kind of need somebody who's good on the detail, whereas Gordon Brown and Theresa May were both very heavy on detail, but less good at making decisions. They almost let the detail 
I don't know, flood over them and it, it mm. muddied their brains. And civil servants, who effectively are the ones who implement the decisions, they like strong leadership. Um, they, they don't necessarily expect a prime minister to be across every single bit of the detail, but they want a decision and they want a decision quickly. And of course, Margaret Thatcher, um, she was across the detail, but she was capable of making quick decisions. She was a lot more pragmatic than people thought. She was always, always portrayed herself as a conviction politician. Um, but she was quite pragmatic, but a good decision maker. So I think she was very effective. Um, Churchill, again, obviously, most people would put him at number one on the list of top 55 prime ministers. Um, again, he wasn't a, a particular, well, in some ways, he was a details man, but he, he was very, he was obviously very hot on the leadership side. And depending on when you are prime minister, there are, there are some times when prime ministers fit the right time, and he certainly rose to the occasion in the 1940s. I think Margaret Thatcher was the right prime minister for her time. But that, you look at more recent ones and you think, well, was Theresa May the right person to be prime minister immediately after the Brexit vote? I think history will probably say absolutely not. Mm. I think luck plays a, a big part in it a, as well. Um, and again, Margaret Thatcher, I think, was quite lucky in that she had a split opposition during most of her time, which enabled her to win massive parliamentary majorities and carry out her agenda. She was lucky in her opponents. She was lucky in having Arthur Scargill as leader of the miners. She was lucky in having General Galtieri invade the Falklands in some ways, because um, she obviously became much more popular after winning that war. But in, in terms of effectiveness, I think you'd have to go hard to beat somebody like um, Asquith or Lloyd George, where Asquith was a great domestic prime minister, but wasn't yeah. the right person to lead us through the First World War. And he was then replaced by Lloyd George, who had had a stellar um, political career as chancellor, in, introducing lots of measures uh, on the welfare state. Um, and then he became a great war leader. But then, of course, one thing I found from the book is that I thought that really all, all of these welfare measures that have been brought in by that Liberal government had been brought in by Asquith and Lloyd George. But actually, they, most of them were dreamt up by Sir Henry Campbell Bannerman. Mm -hmm. Now, how many people listening to this podcast know anything about Sir Henry Campbell Bannerman? I, I didn't, I have to admit. Um, so he he's somebody that if I was ranking prime ministers without really having done this book I would have probably put him in the, in the bottom quarter but I think he deserves to be in the top half now because of that record on the welfare state so there's all sorts of things that you find out when when you start compiling a book like this. I think just let's segue really quickly because you've mentioned Thatcher and Churchill if you've been watching The Crown I have. I, what do you think? So I haven't made it to series four. I'm finding it increasingly icky as they get more into the modern era because I think it's kind of disrespectful yeah. when people are still alive. But John Lithgow was phenomenal as Churchill, wasn't he? Yes, he was. Um, I, I've watched all sorts of things where both Thatcher and Churchill have been portrayed by various different actors. And uh, most of them do quite a good Churchill. The, the first one that I remember was Timothy West. His was, I still think, the, the best. Um, I, I rather agree with you on The Crown. I think it's changed over the series. If you, do, if you think it's getting like that, you won't like series four at well, all. I'm only on series one, uh, episode one, series three, but I find that the first, yeah. I think the first two are whimsical and charming yeah. and they're well, set a long time ago and now I've, I feel like it's kind of disrespectful. And I'm someone like from a distance, not face to face, the Queen has been very good to me with my history subjects and my research and access and things like that. And I just feel like, how would you feel if that was your grandma that people were doing that to? She has no right of reply. Well, I think that the first two series were fairly accurate in the events that they portrayed. Yes, there were a few uh, things where you could say, I'm not quite sure it happened like that. But in this current series, and if you haven't seen it, I don't want to spoil it for you, but mm. there are various things that just did not happen. Um, now, Margaret Thatcher did visit Balmoral every summer and spent a weekend with the Queen. But the way this is portrayed, I, I know why they've done it. They, essentially, the whole weekend was spent by the royal family humiliating Margaret Thatcher. Now, there is no way that happened. Um, mm. Several of the royal family were actually quite fans, big fans of Margaret Thatcher, the Queen Mother in particular. But that doesn't come out here at all. And I know why they've done it, because what they're trying to essentially portray is the slightly awkward relationship that there apparently was between the Queen and Margaret Thatcher. 
but they they've just exaggerated it for dramatic effect and there's also things where they 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 look at the 1981 cabinet reshuffle where margaret thatcher got rid of a lot of the so-called cabinet wets and they make elementary mistakes she has a little tick list where she's ticking off names and she ticks off soames well, Sir Christopher Soames was never in her cabinet, yeah. and Nicola Soames wasn't even an MP in 1981. So I don't know what they th were thinking of there. They had her sacking Francis Pym, who was not sacked in that reshuffle. He left after the 1983 election. Now, OK, small things, which only p political geeks like me will notice, but it kind of undermines everything else. And you think, well, how accurate are the, is the rest of it if they can get things like that wrong? I think that that's the problem, isn't it? it? They'll tell you, well, it's a soap opera. And they're like, well, you've chosen to make a soap yeah. opera about real people, many of whom are still living. Um, and you have to appreciate that that's going to make some people deeply uncomfortable because you've made a rod for your own back in terms of accuracy and things because these are all real people. Um, but but they, I find that it's becoming a bit like a pantomime. Well, it, it is. And some some of the portrayals of some of the different characters are a bit pantomime -y. And Gillian Anderson playing Margaret Thatcher actually, I think, does a reasonable job. She's got her mannerisms right she's got that pigeon walk right the hair is perfect her face though i mean we can't no one can help their face but she yeah. she doesn't look anything like margaret thatcher and and she exaggerates the voice to such an effect <laughs> and, Although, and it becomes a caricature as a royal historian, though, the caricature of Edward VIII in the first two series, oh, yeah. it was so bang on. It's well, obviously done to ludicrous levels, but I just, I'm talking with Alex Larman, who's written a, a book as well about Edward VIII, and, and we're sitting there watching it going, yeah, that's our boy. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, got... the, the guy who plays Prince Charles, I think, is actually really good. Um, he gets this sort of tortured soul absolutely right. He looks mm. a little bit like him. He's got his mannerisms, but he would play a brilliant Gordon Brown in the future. He's only 30, so to carry off playing Prince Charles at 43 when he marries Diana is quite something. But he looks a bit like Gordon Brown, um, a young Gordon Brown. So in about 20 years' time, if anybody makes a biopic of Gordon Brown, he's your man. I just want to add in here that I am on season one, episode four, and it's taken me two to three tries to get to that stage. Really? Yeah, I just, I can't get... What kind get... of person are you? I know. <laughs> just don't. She famously can't tell the difference between Edward VIII and Edward VI. So she never had one of those rulers as a child that you got a, as a souvenir when you went on a school trip that listed the uh, monarchs for you. Well, but it's no. funny because I, I, my next book was going to be a similar structured book on kings and queens. So I, I, I've got two authors ready, haven't I? Yeah, but, definitely. <laughs> but unfortunately, the publishers are already they're already doing um, another royal book next year, so they don't want to do that one. So that oh. one will have to do US presidents next. Oh, that would be good. Yeah, but if, if you ever do need anyone to do George V, I'm Excellent. here for you. Um, we've segued massively, haven't we? <laughs> we were on the post. I'm just, no, it is so topical, isn't it, at the moment? I just, I just, oh, I was cringing on Twitter with all these uh, Meghan Markle posts with the, uh, oh, now I know why she did it. I've seen the crown. These people are yeah. awful. No wonder she left. Yeah, and I'm just like, the oh, thing. my In the, God, the first people. two series of this, you were almost encouraged to like the royal family and find them sympathetic people. Mm. But in the second two series, it's as if they're trying to make you hate them. And in the, in the fourth series, the only pleasant character, bizarrely, is the Duke of Edinburgh. All the others you kind of want to dislike. Yeah, I just... Mm, the I, there's a lot back. of very, very good actors in those latter two series who I just like, you should know better. <laughs> Am I going to have to give it another go again? Oh, uh, yeah. 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 Just okay. at, least, at least so that we can just get drunk and slag it off. <laughs> That's... I can... <laughs> but I'm not very... Night. I'm not very good at, you know, these parts of history, especially Brit British history, so you've got to forgive me. I do no. apologise. Well, you will enjoy the Nazi episode about Edward VIII in series two. That will oh, I do. I'm in for that. is a Holocaust historian, so she will be oh, interested yeah. at least for World War II. But we've segued massively away from the most effective Prime Minister into the most effective portrayal of Prime Ministers in silly TV programmes. Um, but who, when you looked at it, did you think is the least effective like if you you've talked about ranking them if you were gonna if you were gonna do a list now who would you who do you look well, at just think I have, oh i have no. done a list um because i thought hey, it would be a good way to publicize the book and i was right because mm. it got me on the today program which obviously <laughs> sold a lot of books um but it is a very difficult thing to do because how do you compare a prime minister in 1753 to one in 2010 it, it's 
almost an impossible task. There's no science to it. It all has to be based on opinion. So what I did was create 60 different categories and ask all the different authors to mark their prime minister in each of these 60 different categories. So we then got a list and then I got five of the authors together and, and we mucked about with it a bit and then came up with a, what we thought was our definitive list. But of course, everybody will disagree with it. In terms of the least effective, well, Theresa May, I think, would have to qualify uh, for certainly in the top five of the least effective prime ministers because she had one job to get Brexit done and she failed to do it. Now, there are all sorts of reasons why that happened. It wasn't entirely her fault. But when the history books are written, most prime ministers are remembered for one thing, and that's mm. what she will be remembered for, not getting Brexit done. Now, Boris Johnson thought that he would be remembered for getting Brexit done. But what he will be remembered for is COVID, I, I suspect. And I, I've written the chapter on Boris Johnson, which was quite difficult to do, given that he was, he was only about a year in, into the job when I had to write it. Um, so... Going back to your question, I think Theresa May is one of the least effective. Um, a lot depends on the strength of your parliamentary majority. John Major, I think the history books will be kinder to, but you could say that in legislative terms, he was pretty ineffective, although he would argue that he was quite radical. He, he privatised things that Margaret Thatcher never dreamed of privatising. But his European policy was uh, the, his downfall, just as it obviously has been with many uh, prime ministers in, in recent times. Um, and then going back, um, I mean, Alec Douglas Hume was only there for a year, so you could argue that he was fairly ineffective. Uh, Anthony Eden, who would have to rank as one of the worst prime ministers in our history because of Suez, definitely ineffective. Although, you see, he, a bit like Jim Callaghan, they both looked as if they were made for the part. Yes. Um, they both had stellar careers, uh, held great offices of state. But in Callaghan's uh, case, he was in the wrong place at the wrong time. Um, he could have been a really good prime minister, I think, in a different time. Anton Eden, I don't think, actually, in hindsight, would have been a great prime minister whenever. He was just a weak, vain character, and he didn't have the physical or, or mental capacity for the job. Um, so it, it, it is quite interesting, not just to look at who the best prime ministers were, but who were the worst. And, of course, there are some, like George Canning and Viscount Goderich, that were only there for a matter of months. So you can't, you have to rank them at the bottom of the list, almost through no fault of their own. But I think in modern day terms, you'd have to put Anthony Eden as the worst, probably Theresa May as the second worst. Well, there's got to be someone in this book that has surprised you the most surprised me the most now that is a, I, the one that did surprise me the most was one that I didn't know much about and that was the Earl of Derby who was Prime Minister um, I think on three separate occasions in the 1850s and 60s now he came just after the Corn Laws debacle and um, in many ways I learned that he was the father of the modern Conservative Party. He was leader of it for 22 years. His relationships with other Conservatives were quite interesting, particularly with Disraeli. Uh, and that was another surprise in that Edward Young, who wrote the chapter on Disraeli, it's not a flattering portrayal of Disraeli. And most Conservatives see Disraeli as this rather heroic figure, father of one nation, um, a, a great totemic figure in 19th century politics. Yet uh, Edward portrays a slightly different uh, portrayal of a very vain man, um, somebody who wasn't as talented as he liked to portray. And I, that, was, that was kind of news to me, I think. So those were the two that probably surprised me the most. Which one is your favourite? You must have one that is your, your pet one. I, I do it with characters in books all of the time. Um, well, I mean, Margaret Thatcher was the woman that inspired me to get interested in politics. So she's always going to be, uh, of, the, of the prime ministers that I've experienced throughout my adult life, she is the one that I think was the greatest prime minister. Um, if I look through the whole 55, um, Lord Melbourne's fascinates me. 
partly because of his portrayal in in Victoria that did inspire me to learn a bit more about him mm. and again I think um should we say he was rather romanticized in in, in that series I mean I don't think they portrayed him in a very accurate light at all but he, he I find him rather fascinating and also Pitt the Elder as you say to become prime minister at the age of 24 was really quite something. And the fact that he was a, a master of the House of Commons, um, master of all he surveyed in, in a way, and actually achieved, excuse me, achieved great things, I think that he would certainly deserve to be up there. The other one that slightly surprised me was Nicky Morgan's portrayal of Lord North. Now, we all think of Lord North as the one who lost the American colonies. But d- in domestic policy terms, he was actually rather successful. So it's a bit like if you take Watergate out of the equation, you can make a case for Richard Nixon being a very successful U.S. president. But you can't take that out of the equation, just as you can't take the loss of the American colonies out of the equation for Lord Lord North. Cringeworthy. Uh, There's got to be someone there that you read through and you were like, just wow, this is just beyond me. Um... He minds Lloyd George as a military historian. It just... uh... The difference in opinion on Lloyd George between uh, military historians and political historians is hilarious. But yeah, that, that is that is true. And Lloyd George, I think, is a fascinating character because you look at the corruption and you think, well, there's no way that he could ever make it as prime minister today. No. You, you look at Clement Attlee again, and you think, well, there's no way he would become prime minister today, not because of corruption, the very opposite, the fact that he was so boring, the <laughs> fact that he was so normal, the fact that he hated the media and didn't hated doing any kind of interview at all. Uh, and you, you can divide the, the these 300 years up into different ages. And, and obviously nowadays, you have to be able to communicate in a way that you didn't have to communicate 40 or 50 years ago. You have to be able to cope with the demands of a 24-hour news media. And if you can't do that, you're, you're, you're really never going to make it work. I mean, David Cameron, I think, really got that. Tony Blair got that in a way that Gordon Brown never did. He always regarded the media as a, a sort of a shallow and uh, a, an obstacle to what he wanted to do. I mean, he was right to an extent. But, but you've still got to live with them. You have to play the game. Uh, yeah. And this is where Boris Johnson has gone wrong, I think, in that he let Dominic Cummings and Lee Kay and his director of communications effectively hide him away. And if, if Boris Johnson is going to be successful, you have to let Boris be Boris. That's how he got there in the first place. That's why he became mayor of London, contrary to everyone's expectation. And actually, um, I think whatever your politics, he, he didn't actually he didn't do a bad job as mayor of London. Um and you have to recognise, this is another criteria to be a great Prime Minister, you have to recognise your own weaknesses and take measures to counter them. And he did that when he was Mayor of London. He appointed people around him who compensated for things that he couldn't do. He's failed to do that as Prime Minister so far. Um, there is still time for him to rectify that. George W. Bush did that when he became President. He had one of the most talented cabinets of all, t- all time in American politics because he knew that there were things that he didn't know and, and couldn't do. So he got, around, got people around him who could. And there aren't many... Most politicians think that they are omnipotent, that they are narcissists, they're brilliant, they think they are brilliant people and therefore they don't have any weaknesses. Um, There's so many examples of that through history, Um, but they are found out in the end. I think one thing that really interests me is the morality, Uh, just so when I was doing this George V book um, about World War I, just Asquith is sitting in the cabinet room writing tragic yeah. sappy letters to <laughs> someone who's not his wife when he's supposed to be conducting yeah. the war Lloyd George was a philanderer as well and that that makes me laugh I mean, half of them from back in the day would get nowhere now just on morality would they well I don't know Boris Johnson has <laughs> Churchill drinking like a fish as well it's yeah look <laughs> most geniuses are very flawed people whether they're in politics or any any other form of life and it is interesting. It's an interesting phenomenon that Boris Johnson, it's all factored in with him. People know of his philandering. Uh, they know of all of his faults, and yet they still vote for him. And 
that this is where his opponents completely misjudge him. They think that outside the M25, he's got no appeal. Well, the 2019 election proved that he does. And if you walk, uh, walk down a high street anywhere in the country with Boris Johnson, people come out of the hairdressers to have their photo taken with him. And there aren't many politicians that can do that. And he, he's got whatever it is, he's got it in a way that I'm afraid, I mean, Ian Duncan Smith or Michael Howard they didn't have it. Mm. You have to have this kind of this charisma to, I think, really be successful nowadays. And Margaret Thatcher acquired it. She didn't have it to begin with. She acquired it. You, you can learn it, but there aren't many people that have the art of that. Tony Blair had it right from the start. I guess the definition of this is, do they turn heads when they walk into a room? And Tony Blair did. Margaret Thatcher did. Gordon Brown didn't really, and Theresa May didn't, whereas Boris does. And that is one part of being a, a good prime minister. That's um, why I voted for him as mayor of London, because he had that charisma and he was this breath of fresh air that's literally charged into London. And I was like, wow, this guy is really cool. I'm going to vote for him. <laughs> uh, see, I voted for him because Ken Livingston screwed everyone who wasn't in zone one or two. We had no Oyster card in zone five. We had like it, everything Livingston did seem to be for people right in the very centre of London. I think Boris kind of swept the outer boroughs, didn't he? people have had enough i mean you, you've just actually illustrated um how people vote because some people will vote positively for a candidate and others will vote for them as the least worst option mm. um, uh, and in a way if you can combine the two where and boris johnson did this in the last election where he he put forward a relatively positive uh, portrayal and people saw him as a optimistic positive candidate against an extreme an extremely negative candidate in Jeremy Corbyn the positive the optimistic one generally wins elections if you go back in history it is almost invariably the case both in this country and the United States that the the candidate who sells the optimistic vision triumphs and the other the other thing to note and this is, you, you can see this certainly going back to the Second World War and probably before. What, if you have a charismatic prime minister, the next one is always a dull one, followed by a charismatic <laughs> one, followed by a dull one. And it, it, it's fascinating how that holds in, in both countries. And because the electorate, eventually they, they tire of a, a particular type and they want to change. And this is why Keir Starmer... Um, has to be optimistic about the next election because you don't get much duller than him. He is a charisma-free zone, and that may be what the country wants after four years of Boris Johnson, assuming he lasts that long. I've got one last question for you. I think I actually, I think you've kind of revealed which way you'll go on this one. If you could pick any of the 55 from history and put them in charge of COVID, which one would it be? Definitely Margaret Thatcher. I thought you'd say that. <laughs> well, not just because I really admire her, but she mm. did have a scientific background. And uh, there are very few people in government who have any form of scientific background. Now, I don't know about you, but when COVID started, I kind of thought that science was science. But what we've discovered is that it's not. It's an art. It's something that you can have all sorts of different opinions on mm. and never, never be proved wrong. And um, I think that's the frustration for the current cabinet in that they did follow the scientific advice at the beginning and in some ways lived to regret it. But none of them really, I think, were equipped to maybe ask the right questions, whereas she would have been. Interesting answer. This has been so much fun. Ian, thank you so much for coming on to talk to us about the book. Tell everyone again what it's called so they can get an order in for Christmas. It is called The Prime Minister's 55 Leaders, 55 Authors, 300 Years of History. Um, there's a forward by Boris Johnson, which has apparently annoyed some people. They think I shouldn't have had a forward by the current Prime Minister, can you believe? I said, well, if Jeremy Corbyn had been Prime Minister, I would have asked him too. Um, the, 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 the one problem with this book is that it sold so well that nobody's got any copies at the moment. So the publishers have done two reprints already, which given it's a £25 hardback, I'm actually mm. really proud of that it's sold so well so far. So Amazon is saying one to two months delivery time, but they will actually have stock uh, next week. So you will get it in time for Christmas if you order it now. But do order it from your local bookshop rather than Amazon absolutely because uh, use them or lose them with your exactly independent right. bookstores and they can open in most places uh, yeah. as of next week ian thank you thank you very much indeed
Join us on Sunday for a very special programme. We will be commemorating the Halifax explosion during World War One, and we'll be doing that with Matt and an expert um, because Matt's granddad or great uncle or someone was actually there. We're about to record this and I will know by the time it airs, so don't miss that one. And then on Monday, we will be talking to Frank McDonough. He's an absolute legend. He has a new book out. It's the next instalment in his history of Nazi Germany during the war. Uh, so don't miss that. It is brilliant. And he just he can waffle for England and everything he says is amazing. So don't miss that one. Don't forget that we do exist on Patreon as History Hack, and on Patreon as well, which is Podbean's own version. Uh, Alina and I have had massive fun doing this in 2020, but life's going to change quite a lot next year and we're going to actually have to go and earn a living, etc. If we want to keep up the regularity that we've been bringing you and the kind of guests that we've been bringing you and the workload, then we will need your help. So uh, if you join, there's going to be incentives for joining on either of those platforms. We're revamping ourselves on both of them. So don't forget to go in. You can do as little as a dollar a month and it all goes towards keeping up History Hack as regular as we've been able to bring it to you this year. We are now on YouTube. We are posting all of our new episodes on there and we have our own channel and we are gradually posting all of the back episodes because we have been made aware of the fact that you can only find the last hundred on some platforms. So you can go and listen to your heart's content and laugh at the cartoons and have a great time. So do go over there and subscribe.